I see some folks loading in from the waiting room. Hello, welcome to Earth Day every day, everyone. We're just going to wait a little bit as people load in, and then we're going to get on with the program. And, my um, name, yes. Okay, okay go ahead, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. I was going to say, my name is Blythe. I'm with the city of Dallas. Vanessa, you go ahead, too. <laughs> oh, I was just going to do some housekeeping real quick before we got yes, started. Yes, absolutely. Um, people are um, coming in. Um, so you will be on mute for the program. However, you have questions for our presenter or just comments. Um, things you want to share, you can go ahead and put those in the chat and we'll get to those um, after the presentation. Um, and also this is being recorded. Uh, you have to accept an agreement when you logged in. Uh, if you don't want to appear on the recording, you can go ahead and turn off your camera. Um, and then the recording will be available later to view on YouTube and we'll also send out a link to that as well. All right, and um, thank you Blythe and I'll let you do, do your thing. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Vanessa. So um, as she said, too, this program is being recorded, which means you can come back to us, too. Um, and that recording link will be sent if you are registered. And if you're on YouTube, hello. Um, but I'm Blythe. I'm with the City of Dallas in the Environmental Quality and Sustainability Department. And that did take me a minute to remember and say that quickly, but I learned it. And here we are. Um, and here we're here with Earth Day every day. We're here most Thursdays at noon. So if this is your first, fifth, sixth time with us, Welcome, welcome again, welcome back, welcome for the first time. So um, if you've never heard of the Environmental Quality and Sustainability Department for the city of Dallas, we were established about 2004 and we're here now today. Um, but just something that I really wanna point out out of our timeline is that we were able to um, unanimously vote in our climate action plan in 2020. And we are now kind of reaching just over the first year of our CCAP plan which has 97 actions. And we have been tackling 47 of those actions here this year, which I think is so super amazing and cool. So a little bit of history about us. And if you've never heard about us, um, we do have dallasclimateaction.org uh, or you can go to Green Dallas uh, as well to find out more about us. But what do we do? We do outreach and education. So I'm in outreach and education, but if you care about the environment and you're in the DFW area, you're in the right place because we cover topics from A to Z, from air pollution control to zero waste. We have a lot of different departments and in outreach and education, I better know those departments. So I skipped ahead, I'm sorry. In our outreach and education, we also like to say that we cover topics from A to Z. And today we will be tackling D for dragonflies with our wonderful Mr. Sam Kishinik, who will be our speaker. But before we get into that, I just like to talk about stormwater really quick. We can see this green tile here on stormwater management and a lot of what we do for the city in our qual in the DEQS um, is stormwater management. And I just want to do a quick intro to it. If you've never heard about it, or if you know absolutely from head to toe what it is, stormwater is our water, right? And when it rains, it usually pours in Texas and that water needs somewhere to go. So it usually goes into these stormwater inlets and these drains and all that water drains out and then we can drive in our streets. Awesome. We love city planning. But unfortunately, what is ever it's in these streets, what's ever in our front yards, what's ever in our backyards can get carried away in water runoff, right? So maybe litter gets run off into the water. We can see some leaf debris on this right picture. We see some litter. We see a mask, uh, which is a health hazard issue. So really what I'm trying to say is please never litter pick up your grass clippings and be sure that you always pick up after your pets because all of these things that could be sitting in our yards could be washed away right after a heavy Texas rainstorm or even a light one and get into our stormwater and pollute it. So if you don't wanna be playing with your pet's pet's waste and our lakes and our rivers and our oceans, please pick up after them. I know it's also a good neighborly thing to do. But then also if we're taking care of our air, we're taking care of our water because of the water cycle, we remember it. So walk or bike or carpool when it is safe and possible. Think about the air, think about no idling when you can um, and just do your part. And that's what we're here to do today. But today, especially we're gonna be learning a lot. And we talked a little bit more about this, Sam, um, that we're gonna be talking about dragonflies. And sometimes bugs are a strange topic for folks, but we hope uh, at the end of every session, you feel a little bit more enthusiastically empowered to save the earth. And we hope at the end of this session, you feel a little bit more enthusiastically empowered to talk to people about dragonflies and hopefully protect dragonflies and just know a little bit more because we always know knowledge is power, what have you. But Sam, 
please uh, feel free to unmute. And I just wanted to introduce you real quick. Sam is an urban wildlife biologist with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. He's worked with us on Earth Kids and other outreach topics. Um, he's been an amazing source. So if you have any questions today, this is the guy to ask over dragonflies. Sam, uh, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks, Blythe, for uh, the great introduction and keep up the good work. Stormwater management is a crucially, crucially important thing. And water is essential for not just us, but so many other critters that we share the Metroplex, that we share Texas, that we share the planet with. So it's not just for us that we do these things. It's for all of our living neighbors. So uh, it's super, super important stuff. So today, what we'll be talking about well, these critters live part of their life cycle in water. So that's an important thing to start out with, the, the importance of water. Water is crucially important to these critters too. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that. All right. Again, my name is Sam Kieschnick. I'm an urban wildlife biologist in, in Dallas, Fort Worth. And basically, I tell people that I study the critters that live with us in the city. So some of my dear friends work in West Texas, work in the lower Rio Grande Valley, work in the rainforest of Costa Rica. Well, my rainforest is the city of Dallas. And it may sound a little odd to hear that, but there is so much diversity, biodiversity, even within the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. And believe it or not, we have a lot of these critters. These are dragonflies. And we'll talk all about how to tell dragonflies from other bugs. And one of these other bugs that we'll start out with is this guy. Does anybody know what this little critter is? is. And I think, yep, I even heard some people yelling it at their screen. That is a mosquito. They're also called skeeters. I don't know what you want to call them. You can call them annoying. They, uh, you can almost hear this picture that zzz, the sound that they make as they buzz around us. They can be pretty uh, annoying, but they can also be a pest. And right now, if you've gone outside, typically around dusk, just as the sun is going down, the mosquitoes smell you. They smell that carbon dioxide that you're breathing and even that your skin is releasing. So they're smelling that and they like to suck that blood. So I don't think that there are too many people that are fans of mosquitoes. And we like to do things to get rid of mosquitoes. One of the things that some people put up are these zappers. And you'll hear the zzz, zzz, zzz of them. And you'll think, yes, we got mosquitoes. All right, we got some mosquitoes. Well, the truth of these bug zappers is they are not effective for mosquitoes at all. They're not effective for mosquitoes barely at all. They're really effective at killing off moths and little beetles, stuff that's attracted to the light, but very rarely do they get mosquitoes. So even when you hear that zip, zip, the zap of the bug zapper, it's probably not zapping a mosquito. It's probably zapping a harmless moth or a charming little beetle. So we have some critters that eat mosquitoes. It's true that bats and birds, they'll eat some of the mosquitoes, but the reality is that they're going for more of the bigger bugs than the mosquitoes. If you have a choice between a burger or a French fry, if you're hungry, you're probably gonna go for that burger. In the same manner, if a bat is hungry, is it gonna go for a nice juicy moth or an itty bitty French fry like mosquito? Well, probably more so the moth. Not to say that they won't eat some mosquitoes, some fries every now and then, but they're not really the best mosquito control or they don't really eat too, too many mosquitoes. The same with our birds like this lovely purple martin. Sure, they will eat some of the mosquitoes, but typically they're going after the bigger bugs. Dragonflies. Dragonflies are the best mosquito killers that we know of. 
they eat mosquitoes in all of their stages. So as adults, they'll eat them. And even as youngsters, they'll eat the baby mosquitoes. So it's a good thing to like dragonflies, especially if you get annoyed by mosquitoes. So real quick, uh, dragonflies, they are in the order odonata. And that's a scary Latin word that actually means tooth. The guy that first identified mosquitoes a long, long time ago, he saw some teeth or some jagged edges on uh, the, the dragonflies, so came up with the name odonata. And sometimes we'll call them odes or odinate. And there's around 6,000 species of dragonflies and damselflies that exist that we know of on the planet. And this little picture you saw this, uh, oops, you saw this little, oh, I'm sorry. You saw this, there we go. This little damselfly that's cleaning off its eyes, its compound eyes there. They are really charming critters. I am quite charmed by dragonflies. And hopefully by the end of this, you too will be charmed. So I mentioned this earlier, a damselfly. So what's the difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly? Well, they're, it's, it's kind of a broken out grouping that we like to use for the odonates or for odonata. But dragonflies and damselflies have some interesting differences. Let's look at dragonflies first. When you look at the face of a dragonfly, Typically, the eyes, those compound eyes, we'll talk about those in a second, are pretty close together, almost touching. Um, they also have fairly large wings. Uh, they typically are a little bit larger than some of the damselflies. They also usually, not always, but usually they will rest with their wings straight out like that. So they'll rest with their wings straight out. Damselflies they have their eyes a little bit further apart. They typically are a little smaller, uh, less stout, more slim than our dragonflies. And then uh, they'll also rest with their, their wings straight back like that. So the way that they rest is a little bit different than our dragonflies. So let's look at the life history of these beasties. And that's a word that one of my friends from England told me about. Uh, beasties is the name that they use for bugs. So if you're ever in England, you could say, I'm going out beastie hunting, and they'll know that you're going out bug hunting. So let's look at the life cycle of these. First of all, we'll start with the eggs of dragonflies and damselflies. So they are aquatic uh, in this stage. So they will find a little pond, a creek, a drainage ditch, and that's where the female will lay her eggs. And in this case, we're looking at two dragonflies and the male is actually holding on to the female as she is laying eggs into the water. This is a pretty cool stage, the young stage. Um, in some bugs, we call it the, the caterpillar stage or the larval stage. Well, in dragonflies, we call it the nymph stage or the naiad stage. And these are hunters. They are aquatic hunters. And you'll see that one gif on the side that shows this extendable pharynx or this lower jaw that reaches out and it grabs bugs. I hope that doesn't give anyone nightmares, but it's a pretty cool structure. It's kind of like that movie Alien, the little thing that comes out. Well, the naiad of our dragonflies have that same sort of structure. It just goes out and grabs a little mosquito larva or a little minnow or a tadpole. And then we have the emergence. So kind of like how a caterpillar turns into a cocoon or a chrysalis, the dragonflies don't really have that true chrysalis stage. Instead, what they do is their last instar or their last stage as a nymph or a naiad, they'll go out of the water, climb up on some of the vegetation or on the dock or whatever is available. They'll go out and then the adult emerges from that naiad stage. And much like cicadas, I don't know if you're hearing any cicadas out right now, they have the same sort of life cycle, only they live in the soil, in the ground, and they come out and the adult emerges. With dragonflies and damselflies, 
the youngsters live in the water and they emerge to fly around in the air. And then one of the things that they do is they'll find her boyfriend or girlfriend. They'll find that mate. And one of the kind of charming things about dragonflies, specifically with damselflies, when they're mating, they sort of form this heart shape. I don't know if you can see it on the, the left side, but you may have to twist your head a little bit to see that little blue heart of the male and the female. But the male will hold on to the female as they reproduce. And sometimes the males will actually protect the female as she is laying eggs. They'll fly around and make sure that no other critters come in to disturb her in the egg laying process. So let's look at the adults of our dragonflies. And they are amazing hunters. And this is one of the dragonflies that I have in my little fingers there. And if you look at the legs of these, you'll see that they're asymmetrical. That's a scary word that means that they're different sized. So we have bigger legs in the back and then shorter legs in the front. One of the things that they do is when they're flying around, they will fly with basically a bug net in their legs. They'll have the big ones that sort of go out towards the back, and then the smaller ones will sort of cup those bigger ones. So they'll fly around with a big bug net to catch all of those little mosquitoes that pester us. You can also notice a lot of little spines on the legs. If I was with you in person, and if we had a dragonfly with us, I'd let it uh, rest on all of your little fingers, and you could see and feel all of the little spines on those legs. They have all of those to help them catch the little bugs in midair. Some sort of sciency words that we'll deal with. And these are some words, try to use them three times today. Blythe, try to use this three times in your next conversation. The terra stigma. And the terra stigma, it's that little tiny sort of blackish part on the wings. And this actually helps them fly around. It keeps them balanced as they're flying around. So as you look up close at dragonflies, hopefully you'll notice some of these structures like the terra stigma, that little part on the wings that helps them balance out their flight. I think that the eyes of dragonflies are magnificent. They are amazing. And when I stare at it, I almost can get lost in those little eyes, those big eyes, actually. So bugs, so insects like our dragonflies have eyes that are made up of thousands, hundreds of thousands of little lenses. And each one of these lenses forms an image. So they're able to see all over the place just with those big compound eyes. I don't want to get too, too lost in the science here, but they actually see the whole world differently than we do. We see it in basically three colors, three, their trichromatic vision is what our lenses have. Dragonflies can see it in 15 to 30 different shades. So colors that we don't even have words for, dragonflies are seeing the world in those colors. There's a lot of neat science that goes into this, some genetic research that has gone into this to, to trying to understand how dragonflies see the world. And it is amazing. Colors that we don't even have words for, they can see. And believe it or not, um, Blythe and I we were talking about monarchs earlier. And monarchs, you may know about monarchs, how they migrate around. Believe it or not, dragonflies, some dragonflies even migrate. And they do it over, much like the monarchs, over multiple generation. And they can fly over 400 miles as adults. And I don't know if you know how big a mile is, but a mile compared to a dragonfly that's like this big is really long, really, really long. It would take me almost forever to walk 400 miles. And if you were a dragonfly this big to fly 400 miles, it's pretty amazing. So some of them can even migrate. Right now, if you've been outside lately, you've probably noticed that it's pretty hot. 
And dragonflies recognize this too. And some of their positions, they're kind of like yoga positions, are pretty interesting. One of them is called the obelisk position. And if you know about Egyptian culture, they have those long obelisks that basically point up to the stop, the to this um, to the sun. Well, the same sort of thing with dragonflies. As they're resting about, they will stick their little hiney straight up into the into the air to reduce the surface area. So it's not quite as hot for them. So you may see some of the dragonflies doing this obelisk pose. So let's look at some of the dragonflies and damselflies that are common to us in Texas. There's about 160 different species of dragonflies. So we'll look at dragonflies first. And I hope that you can remember some of these names. I think they have the coolest sounding names. The pond hawk is the name of this first one. And with dragonflies and some damselflies, we have differences between boys and girls. Um, in this case, we have the green one is the girl and the bluish one is the boy. So the, depending on how you're looking at the screen, the one on the left side or the right side uh, is the green one. That is going to be a female and the male is a blue one. Pond hawks, you'll find these around pretty much any body of water, lakes, rivers, creeks, ponds, even drainage ditches. You can find these. They're quite common. And again, they love eating mosquito. Mm, they love eating mosquitoes. This is one that migrates, and this is a pretty big one called the green darner. And I also put in parentheses the scientific name. As a biologist, um, I like to learn some of the Latin names for insects and for bugs and plants and birds and all that sort of stuff. It helps me to communicate with other people that may not speak English. We all share that scientific language of Latin. So you'll see the, the scientific name in parentheses. But the English name for these is the common green darner. And you can see the male is holding on. He's quite a bit above water, holding on to the female as she is laying eggs in the water. Then we'll have our blue dasher. Let's see. There's dasher and dancer and prancer and, uh, oh gosh, I can never remember the rest of them. But the blue dasher is a, a dragonfly. Dasher is a dragonfly. So that's probably where Santa Claus came up with the name of the reindeer. Said, you know what? This reminds me of a blue dasher. I'm going to name this reindeer Dasher. Well, the blue dasher is another common one, relatively common one for us in the Metroplex. The female looks a little more yellow than the bluish uh, blue dasher, but you can see them both resting on little structures out there too. Another neat thing, look at the eyes of both of these, those big compound eyes. You can see tons of colors in those multiple lenses of the compound eyes. Then we have the common white tail. So we had the pond talk, we had the dasher, we have the white tail. And the white tails, well, they have white tails. So you can see the male on the right side has a very bright white tail. The female doesn't have quite the same uh, whitish tail, but she does have some little white specks that go along the abdomen or the tail of our dragonflies. You can also see that the patterns of the wings are slightly different on these as well. And I know that they're dragonflies because their eyes are pretty close together. Their wings are, are spread out like that when they're resting. They're also pretty big. I know you can't really get a, a sense of scale from the pictures, but they're pretty big compared to our smaller damselflies that we'll get in a second. Then we have the widow skimmer. So another cool sounding name for these. The male also has a bit of a white tail, but has a little bit more white on the wings. And the female on the left side looks a little bit more yellow. So we have the differences and we call this dimorphic where the boys look a little bit different than the girls. So the female and the male or the girl and the boy, um, widow skimmer. Some of them are red too. And this one is called the flame skimmer. 
And you can see the female has some orange on her, but the male is quite vibrant. Uh, almost a flame-like color that this dragonfly has in its wings and in its body. One of my favorite ones is this, the Halloween pennant. And you can kind of see why it's called Halloween. It's got the blues and the, or I'm, I'm sorry, it's got the oranges and the blacks on those wings. And in this case, the female and the male look pretty similar. They have both the same kind of colored wings, relatively the same body size and the same body colors uh, as well. So not always do you see some differences between the males and the females, but you can see some in, in the previous ones. These are really, really cool. You'll also find these by the Trinity River. That's where I find a whole bunch of these Halloween pennants. So if you're close to the Trinity River, look around the tall grasses. You may see some of these dragonflies. Now, this is also one of the interesting exceptions. When they're resting, they don't put their wings all the way out, but they kind of put them up, not quite touching. But it's one of the things that I love about biology and I love about nature is we have all of these rules that we like to put things in. And then there are these lovely rule breakers that sort of bend with the rules. They live in the gray instead of the black and the white. And that's the fun part of biology and nature, too. So let's look at a few of our damselflies. So we talked about some of the dragonflies and some of their differences. About 160 species of dragonflies. We have about 77, give or take, species of damselflies. This is one that I see. Actually, I see it all over the place, not even close to water, although I do see it close to water too, but I'll see this in prairies. I'll see this in lawns. I'll see this kind of all over the place. It's called the familiar bluet. And you can't really see it with the eyes on the head, but they're quite a bit apart. The wings, when it's at rest, they are resting flat against the body. But these, you know, they're give or take maybe two inches long, and they are mosquito eaters. They, again, love to eat mosquitoes. You can also see that even on the damselflies, the legs, the hind legs, the back legs are a little bit larger than the front legs. As they're flying about, they are flying with their hands or with their legs, always ready to catch that mosquito that may pester us. Then we have the dancers. So we have the bluets and the dancers, the powdered dancers. I see these close to water that is moving quickly. So on some of the parts of the Trinity River or on some creeks or rivers that you maybe visit, if there's fast moving water, I see these guys. And they're called dancers, well, partially because they dance. They dance around as they're flying either catching mosquitoes or trying to impress a potential partner. So we have the male that's, uh, that's above the female that's holding on to the female. The males kind of have this powdery gray look to them, whereas the females look a little bit less powdery. And then we have the fragile fork tails. So again, I love the names of our dragonflies. We had pennants, we had pond hawks, we had dancers, we had darners, uh, skimmers, and these are fork tails. And the fork tails on their abdomen, especially on males, they'll have this little, almost like a fork-like structure, these kind of pinchers, although they don't pinch, they don't sting, they just use those to hold on to the females. But these are fragile fork tails, and I don't know if you can see it, but on the left side, there's the thorax or basically the body of a dragonfly, and it has an exclamation point. Do you see the neon green exclamation point? You may have to wiggle your head a little bit to see it, but they have an exclamation point. This is how I remember their name. They are fragile, the fragile fork tail exclamation point with fragile. They're pretty small, about maybe an inch to an inch and a half or so. These are called ebony jewel wings. 
And we do have them in Dallas, Fort Worth. They're a little bit more east of us, but a great place to see these is at uh, Leela or Lake Louisville Environmental Learning Area. They have got a great section kind of deep in the forest of a creek that runs through that area. And that's where these guys like to hang out. They like to hang out in the shade, um, in the sort of mottled shade where they'll get a little bit of sun to show off those bright green colors, but typically they're flying around in the shade. The males of these, they're on the right side or on the, the other side of the one that has the white terra stigma. I don't know if you remember that word, the little terra stigmas. The females have white terra stigmas, whereas the males lack those. They have darker terra stigmas, but bright, bright green, ebony colored. So ebony jewel wings, another cool name for damselflies. And then let's talk more about these rule breakers. Here's a damselfly. This is a damselfly. And when it's resting, it is spreading its wings out. And we even call this group of damselflies the spread wings because they're breaking the rules. So we'll give them the name of the rule breaker. You're spreading your wings. All right, we'll call you spread wings. So the great spread rings like this one right here, this is a male. The females don't have quite as much color, but you can see the eyes are pretty far apart. The wings, even though they're normally resting, they're sort of spreading out uh, on this one, but typically it's more slender, more slim than our dragonflies. So I love dragonflies. I think they're super charming. They have the coolest names, but do we want them? Do we want them in our yards, in our backyards? And we were even talking earlier about some of the myths about dragonflies and about bugs in general. Some people worry that they sting. When they fly around, they'll sting you. Dragonflies can't do that. They don't have the stinging tools. Some people worry about them biting us. And really, to get bitten by a dragonfly, you have to grab onto it and push it into your finger to get it to bite you. So they're not going to bite us. I think they are great to have in the backyard all around us. So if you want dragonflies, you really need to start out with plants. The foundation of all ecosystems here in Dallas-Fort Worth, in Texas, and pretty much around the world is plants. So with dragonflies, they need aquatic plants, but they also need plants on the land too. And you might say, whoa, 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 Sam, I thought you said that they eat bugs. They don't eat plants. Well, the bugs that they eat, not just mosquitoes, but other little flies, other little moths, other little butterflies, they eat plants. So they need the things that eat the plants. So it all starts out with that foundation of plants. For our dragonflies, aquatic plants are super important. And Blythe, I'm so glad that you mentioned uh, stormwater management because they are actually used as bioindicators. That's a scary word that means that they tell us the conditions of the water or the conditions of the habitat. If we see a lot of different species of dragonflies, it tells us and it tells Blythe that the water is relatively safe, that it is relatively clean, not super polluted. If you went to an area with water and you're not seeing any dragonflies, it tells me and it tells Blythe that the water is probably not good. It's not good for other invertebrates. It's not good for plants. So it's probably not going to have dragonflies around. So we actually can use these as bioindicators. The diversity of dragonflies tells us a little bit about the quality of the water. So if you want to go out and observe dragonflies, I hope that you do. One of the great websites that I use is iNaturalist. I love, love, love this website. It's a community. It's a database. It is a network of people that love nature, nature nerds, if you want to call us, that's okay. Uh, we love to be out in nature. We love to share photos of nature. And it's also a way that you can see what species are found in an area. So you can search by your county and even some of your parks. 
For instance, if you ever go around White Rock Lake, if you search White Rock Lake on iNaturalist, you will see all of the dragonflies or all of the butterflies or all of the birds that have been observed there. So it's a great way that we can use a field guide online and see the different critters that we are seeing. And if you take pictures of some of these, either with a phone like this or with a camera, I love to take photos of dragonflies. They're really, really fun, and they're quite photogenic, actually. So whenever I'm outside, I will bring my camera with me. I'll also bring my little phone with me, and I will make observations of dragonflies and share them that way, too. If you want to try to catch dragonflies, you may have to be pretty speedy. And either running around or if you stay in one spot, you got to be quick with your wrist. But I use a bug net, a butterfly net to catch these. I go to a website called Acorn Naturalist to, to get some of my bug nets. So uh, that's another place where you can order some bug nets too. But if you try to catch dragonflies, don't be discouraged if it takes you quite a few swings to catch them. They can be really, really hard to catch. And that's because they are aerial helicopters. They're flying around and they have eyes that go almost all the way around their head. So it's even hard to sneak up on a dragonfly because it's looking all the way around. And I looked online earlier on the Dallas Public Library to see if y'all had some of these books. And absolutely, the library has some of these books. And these are the best books of dragonflies that I know of in Texas. They're all written by a dragonfly expert that's in Texas named John Abbott. And there's Damselflies of Texas, Dragonflies of Texas, and then also a book that has both the dragonflies and the damselflies of the South Central United States. But these are great field guides. And if you want, if you're into this, they make good uh, Christmas gifts and good uh, uh, birthday gifts too. So they're really, really fun. And I like to look through them and sort of find the ones that I want to look for uh, too. So those are some great books for it. So I've got a challenge for everyone here. And Blythe, I see you right there. I've got a challenge for you too. So I want you to go outside. I want you all to go outside. And I want you to, if you can, go to a place that either has a creek or has some water, a drainage ditch even works. If you can visit one of the lakes uh, here in Dallas, Fort Worth, that's cool. A pond, any of those places that have some water. And what I want you to do is, well, basically, I want you to take it easy. I want you to chill out. I want you to just sit out there. And I want you to watch, look around for different dragonflies. And what's cool about dragonflies, what I've noticed, is once you go to a place and just start looking for them, you know, they're sort of skittish. They fly all over the place. But when I sit down and I sort of relax for a moment, and especially if there's some tall grass or some reeds or maybe some sticks that are close to the water, if I sit and rest for a little bit, the dragonflies will come right up to those areas. They'll come right up next to you, but you have to sit still maybe for a little while. So that's my challenge for everybody watching is go outside. If you can go to a pond, a lake or a creek or a river or some spot that has water and sit and wait and watch for the different dragonflies. If you're able to take a picture of it, cool. You can put it up on iNaturalist to share with all of the citizen scientists out there, including biologists like myself. That's cool. But the main challenge is just to go out to look at some of the dragonflies and to try to find some of the different kinds out there. Um, I do this all the time. I was just doing this yesterday with my nephew and niece. We were out looking at dragonflies. We sat down and we looked at the different dragonflies around us. It's great fun. And I hope that you can learn to appreciate and uh, be thankful for these dragonflies. Again, they love to eat mosquitoes. So let's like dragonflies together. 
With that, I would love to take any questions or comments. Um, I do have an email address. I'm going to leave this uh, screen up for a little bit. So again, my name is Sam Kieschnick. My email address is Sam period Kieschnick. I've got a long, long last name. Fortunately, my parents gave me the first name of Sam. So that's pretty easy to remember. Uh, Sam Kieschnick at tpwd.texas.gov. I'm also really active on iNaturalist. My username is Sam Biology. So if you take any pictures of dragonflies or of bugs or of grasses or of trees or of any of that sort of stuff, you can also tag me on iNaturalist with the little at sign Sam Biology. So I would love to address any questions. Um, I think the chat has a, a few notifications if there's any questions there, or if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question, that's okay too. I would love to address any questions. Well, thank you, Sam. First off, thank you, thank you. I've got plenty of questions if um, the audience does not. So uh, audience, feel free to ask your questions. Otherwise, I'll take Sam's time too, because there was so much in that. Um, we do have um, Sam's email in the chat and then his iNaturalist is right here. Um, we do have some questions coming in um, and I see one here. It says, what is their range? In other words, I'm not near water. So how close do I need to be to water to see them in my yard? That's a great question. Thank you for ever asked that question. So you'd be surprised that some of these dragonflies will fly quite a bit away from where they emerged. So for instance, in my backyard, I live in a very urban part of Fort Worth. And we don't really have water anywhere close to us, but I'm still able to see some dragonflies flying around every now and then. So you don't necessarily even have to be close to water to see them. They will fly far distances either to migrate or to find prey, potential prey. So uh, if you have a, a backyard, a front yard, or if there's a park that you like to go to, keep an eye out. Even if there's not water, you may see some dragonflies. Some of the dragonflies that I see, and there's so many of them, I could have mentioned a whole bunch of them, but they're called gliders. And there's this one species called the wandering glider. And wandering gliders, they will fly far distances from water and will fly around even soccer fields or large lawns. They'll fly around and sort of glide. They'll never rest. They'll sort of just glide around. So you might see some of those quite a bit away from water. Typically, where I go to see dragonflies is close to water. That's where you'll see the most of them. But a great question on how far their range is. You can see them all over the place, too. And I love what you said. Great answer. <laughs> and I'm, I'm watching the uh, questions uh, in the chat, too. Um, but I love what you said just about bioindicators. Um, that was, I think I may have known that, but I'll say I maybe didn't. Um, and it's kind of fun. It's almost like they are like, um, who's that person that goes into a restaurant to make sure it's food grade? So it's like if the dragonfly is eating, then that's a safe restaurant. But otherwise, It's the Yelp review. It's the yes. Yelp review yeah. of the, 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 the creek or the pond. Exactly right. <laughs> But that's wonderful. They tell us so much. And also they have names like NASCAR, or ice skaters, or horse racing. They have wonderful names. Way cool. <laughs> um, and we're getting things in the chat of loving dragonflies, learning a lot more about males and females, which is a lot that happens in the bug world. Uh, Sam overall has taught me a lot just about bugs and it's been really cool learning about dragonflies. But for nets too, it's kind of, I just wanted to talk about it that it's kind of funny. That it's literally just net. Like there's nothing really, there's no pull out mode. There's no scope. There's no heat detecting sensor. It is just a net and you outside, which I think is part of the fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so I, one of the things whenever I've done uh, programs with anybody, even with adults is I'll give them some of these bug nets and give them the challenge of try to catch me a dragonfly. And it's always fun to see folks chasing after them. But just like I mentioned with sitting still and waiting for them, the same sort of thing. If you have a net uh, and if you're out trying to catch dragonflies, sit still and wait. And then they sort of become comfortable around you. And that's where you can grab them sometimes. 
Um, one of the things too, uh, the different types of nets that are out there. There's some of the smaller nets that some people use for fish. Um, you can use those to catch the aquatic mm -hmm. uh, dragonflies, but it's pretty hard. It is pretty hard if you have a tiny net to catch dragonflies. If you're not able to catch it, it's totally okay with some of these. And it's what I do too with my camera is I'll sort of just sit there and kind of just watch them. And that's an okay thing to do too. If you can't catch them, you can just sit there, watch them and appreciate them that way too. And this isn't so much about dragonflies as a species, but you talked about um, just the, the, I believe it was the Latin name of studying them or just that branch name. What is someone that stud like meteorology what is someone that studies dragonflies called? That's just a, a yeah. So the the insect, the person that studies insects, is an entomologist. Yes. And technically, the person that studies dragonflies is an odo an odo -notinist. And I can have oh, trouble wow. saying to it. Yeah. So they even ha even have that name that has odo uh, in the the title of it. So an odo is a person that studies just dragonflies. So um, I like it. The thing that I like to call myself is a naturalist. Mm -hmm. I call myself a naturalist because even when I'm on the mission of hunting dragonflies, I'll still hear the birds. Mm -hmm. I'll still see a frog jump into the water. I'll still look at some of the flowers. I'll still hear the bees buzzing about. So whenever I'm outside, I like to call myself a naturalist, that I enjoy all of nature, even when I'm foc focusing on just dragonflies. And sorry, my cat's just knocked over some books over there. I don't know if you heard that big. Um, all of nature, right? <laughs> that's right. Yes, exactly. Um, and then uh, Vanessa from the public library asks if there's any particular plants in North Texas uh, that people could plant in their yards to help dragon support dragonfly. How can we be the best dragonfly advocator that we can? Yeah, so great question. Thank you for asking that. So with, with plants and especially for dragonflies, if you have any aquatic features in your backyard, front yard, or in the pond, uh, or in, a, in the park that's nearby, they typically like vegetation that goes out of the water. So things like reeds, um, there's a, a plant called pickerel weed that has flowers on it, but it has aquatic vegetation that's underneath the water and then also has stems that go above. The stems that go above are good for the emergence as the, the naiads come out of the water. It's also good for the adult uh, dragonflies to rest at the tops of those. So if you have any aquatic features in your yard or at the park you like to visit, if you're able to plant some of those reeds that go up above the water, that have some that go into the water and go out of the water too, or if you're out at the park, if you see the cattails, the reeds, those are all really, really good plants for, for dragonflies. If you don't have... Uh, let's say you don't have a koi pond or you don't have a little nature pond. Uh, you just maybe have a swimming pool and you don't want to put plants in your swimming pool. So what sort of things should you use then? What I like to tell everybody is the more diversity of plants that you have in your area, the more diversity of bugs. And we have the saying biodiversity begets biodiversity, BBB. Biodiversity begets or brings biodiversity. So if you have a diversity of plants, you're going to have a diversity of bugs. If you have a diversity of bugs, you're going to have a diversity of birds. If you have a diversity of birds, you're going to have a diversity of more birds or of mammals or of whatever it might be. So that biodiversity brings or begets biodiversity. So whatever plants you plant, do a whole bunch of different types. That's going to be the best, not just for dragonflies, but for nature as a whole. And does that we make started, sense? Hopefully that makes that sense. does make sense. This sounds great. And, and, and it makes sense too. I wanted to say, I guess, for pollinators too, if we're trying to support maybe a butterfly or a bee, we think about shade, water, and a lot of different plants that are local. So yeah. just think about they're, they're a bug that needs the basic needs, um, yeah. which is very cool. And something that we mentioned just in the blurb before we even started this program was dragonflies are a sure shot sign of summer. I can't say that too quickly. Yeah. Um, and you kind of went over it, but, and we talk, talked about water and heat and things like that, but is there a season for dragonflies? And you may have even said that verbatim, but I'm Yeah, curious. no, 
a great question. So when do we go out to look for dragonflies? Mm -hmm. Summertime is the best time. That's when most of them are active. However, dragonflies can be active all times of year. And a question may be, well, how does a dragonfly survive a freeze? Mm -hmm. Some of you may remember the really, really cold temperatures that we had in February. Do you remember that? The super cold temperature where even lakes were getting frozen over. So how does a baby dragonfly survive that? And believe it or not, they do. They do survive. The naiads or the little babies, they will go down to the center of the pond and, or to the lake. And then they'll kind of go through this um, arrested development or they'll go through this sort of waiting stage, kind of like a hibernation or a torpor where they just don't move and they save all of their energy for when it gets a little warmer. And sometimes even in January, we will have a day that's 70 degrees. And I will even go out then and I will see some dragonflies, like there's one called um, the meadow hawk that flies around even in winter time when it's above 60 degrees. So they're active all throughout the year, but the very best time to see them is right now. During summertime is the best time to see dragonflies. Well, it's perfect. You've hit us right on the nail on the head for July because it is hot out. Um, I'll say too, feel free uh, to put some questions in the chat as we wrap up our program. I'm going to put in our next session for Earth Day every day. But Sam, that's all the questions I have. Uh, did you have anything else that you wanted to any, I don't want to cut you off short because there is so much information here. <laughs> well, one of the big things, too, is I hope that everybody, again, you got the challenge there. We all have our challenge. Uh, Blythe, can I see your pinky? We're gonna and do I will pinky look square. for their tarot stigma as well because that is the, that's the word of the day. So pinky promise. Okay, so pinkies, we got our pinkies out. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, the pinky promise is we're going to go outside and we are going to look for some of these dragonflies. And when we see them, look up close, look up yep. as you can, look at their eyes, look for the Terra stigma. Maybe they're doing that obelisk pose if it's really mm -hmm. hot outside. So there's a lot of cool things that we can do um, as we go out. And uh, I hopefully will see some of you all out in the field. Um, maybe it will run into each other at White Rock Lake or at a park in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And hopefully in the future, when we do this program again, maybe we'll go out and catch some dragonflies together. Um, so that would be great fun. I do see a question here too. Um, and it says, I seen swarms of dragonflies in East Texas. Is that a common occurrence? Yeah. So swarms of dragonflies do happen. It happens. And it typically means that there's something else swarming around. And one thing, and I'll go ahead and say it. So when I was in college, uh, one of the coolest experiences that I had, um, it was after dinner and I just got out of the food court and I went to Tarleton, which is in Stephenville. So it's kind of southwest of, of Dallas, Fort Worth. And there's a big lawn outside of the library and I had to go study for a test. So I was walking out there and I noticed a whole bunch of dragonflies that were flying around in circles. So I went out there in the lawn and then uh, I let the dragonflies, a swarm of dragonflies, and they were flying all around me in a circle. And it was so cool. What was really happening is there were ants that were emerging the nuptial ants, the young queens and kings were emerging. So they were flying up. So we had one species of dragonfly, the darners, that were flying close to me in the grass. Above them was another swarm of dragonflies flying around in a circle. And those were um, saddlebag dragonflies. And above them, there were purple martins that were flying above. So I was out there in the lawn in front of the library, just allowing uh, nature to swarm all around me. So yes, there are absolutely swarms of dragonflies that are typically going after swarms of other insects that are flying around. So, so yes, that's a great question. There are these swarms of dragonflies, but to me, it's a welcome swarm because I know that they're going to be eating a whole bunch of mosquitoes and stuff like that. And we mentioned iNaturalist and we already pinky promised on watching. So I'll say, I guess a tip too, on the best places to find dragonflies is maybe even looking at iNaturalist and seeing where those, what dragonfly you want to find and where it was last seen. 
Uh, you can go on the chase for the exact dragonfly that you even want to find if that's something too, wouldn't you say? Or where do you think is Absolutely. the best place in Dallas? That's exactly what I do is I'll go and I'll look through the dragonflies on iNaturalist and see where other people have seen them. And then I'll go, Ooh, I need to go visit that park. I haven't been to that park before. It's got a little pond. It's got a little Creek. That's going to be a great spot to look for dragonflies. Awesome. Well, I think we've got all the notes down. I know what to look for. I know where to go. Yep. And I, I, they're even gymnasts too. So if I see them doing an oblique pose, I'll have to exercise along with them. <laughs> awesome. And again, I remember our pinky promise, Blythe. Mm -hmm. I don't forget. I don't mm -hmm. forget these things. I'll stick to so. my word. Okay, good. Good. Awesome. But it's also been so interesting and I, I just know a lot more now, so I know what to look for. So definitely we'll stick to my pinky promise. And it's also just something to just step out in nature and take a moment with just you in nature. So at the end of this hour too, I hope that you take that away is if you see a dragonfly outside, then you're probably sitting still enough to enjoy nature as we probably should every each day. Yeah. Because it's Earth Day every day, right? <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Sam, for speaking with us. Um, I did put in the chat some resources. Uh, Vanessa from the library has been putting in some great resources too, like find a park in your area with Dallas Parks. Um, I put Earth Kids. So if you have an Earth Kid in your life, they can do a kid version of our Earth Day every day on July 28th. Um, and then we also have another Earth Day every day next week um, with Dr. Marianne Cardin's of SMU. And I typed in SMI nature all around us. But I appreciate your time, Sam, and I appreciate everybody that's been here. And I hope you have a wonderful Thursday. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for going to our program.